Good morning, folks. My brother Mark is rather a cynic, and he always says good morning is an unproven hypothesis. Uh, but, but hopefully we'll prove it uh, correct this morning. Um, it is true that the Utney Reader named me one of the world's 100 leading visionaries. And after doing that, they asked me and a number of other visionaries to give five-minute visionary talks to Town Hall in New York City. Five minutes is kind of a short time to be a visionary. Uh, but I noted that I was the fifth speaker, that the four speakers before me all had very thick lenses in their glasses, as I do. And so it occurred to me that maybe a prerequisite for being a visionary is that you really can't see at all. Uh, so maybe you should take a lot of what I say today under that consideration. Um, yeah, I, I hope you all do check out, and Steve, thank you for those very, very kind words about the Center for Food Safety. Yeah, we have offices in Washington, D.C., in San Francisco, Portland, Los Angeles, and Honolulu. Uh, we have about a dozen attorneys. We've got scientists. And, and um, you know, in these very difficult and dark times that we live in today, um, uh, I, you know, there are, there are some good things happening uh, through what we do and our colleagues. I want to let you know that just recently, you may, how many people here know about neonicotinoids, the pesticides that are killing our bees? People know about that, the neonics, yeah? Well, we just won a big law case uh, that declared 59 of these, were the worst of these neonics, to be illegally approved. Uh, so we're going to get those out of the, out of the environment and, and help save the bees. That just happened. Uh, they are now, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, they're now doing nanotechnology pesticides. Well, we just won a lawsuit uh, that reversed the approval of the very first nanotechnology pesticide. Uh, so <laughs> thank you. And uh, we're fighting this, and we'll talk about this. Uh, I'll probably start off with this a little bit later, but we're, we're going to, um, we're, we're litigating to halt the introduction of a genetically engineered salmon. This is a, a, a terrible product of, of genetic engineering. This salmon has horrible cranial malformations, but they're trying to grow it in Canada and here, and if it were to be, if it were to escape, it would destroy our native salmon species. And we just had a major victory there where the court said that uh, we were entitled to all the information that the FDA has on this. And that, I think once we get that information, we will stop that as well. And, you know, we, we hear about Monsanto and, and Syngenta and Bayer and, 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 and those chemical companies, biotech companies. And sometimes it seems like it's a juggernaut. I mean, I mean juggernaut, how are you going to deal with these guys? Well, I just want you to know, over the last 10 years, we've stopped the approval of genetically engineered wheat, stopped the approval of genetically engineered potatoes, stopped the approval of genetically engineered BGH that goes into um, cows. We've halted all together about 10. Imagine if all the wheat out there was genetically engineered. Imagine if, if, you, if you had all the rice out there that was genetically engineered. So you can beat these guys. And, and we beat them all the time, as do some of our colleagues. Uh, and so, you know, even though these are difficult times, we have to realize that we have the power. Ultimately, we will, we will be victorious. We will win these battles. Um, and I, you know, I want to leave plenty of time at the end of this talk, because I know you probably have a lot of questions about GMOs. I've been working on GMOs since 1985. So I know only too much about the subjects, unfortunately. And yet I still sleep at night. How odd. Um, uh, but any questions you have there, you may be curious about what's going on with organic, uh, beyond organic. You probably heard that I'm uh, uh, president of the board of Certified Humane. Is that a real deal? Is that something you can trust? Uh, what about food safety? What's going on with the Trump administration? How are they doing with biotechnology? How are they doing with organic? What effects is that going to have on our health? What about pesticides? What about EPA and Pruitt? So I'm happy to answer all those questions, but I'm, I'm going to take advantage of you guys. Uh, it is Sunday and around 11 o'clock, so this is usually the time when people hear sermons. So, so like it or not, um, I'm going to deliver a little bit. I, I think I, you know, I grew up as a Catholic uh, out in Jamaica, Queens, and um, so there's probably a frustrated priest in me somewhere, and, uh, somewhere between that and a stand-up comic. Uh, but... Um, I, since I just can't resist this, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay it on you and, and then uh, get into some of the other stuff that, that we want to talk about. Um, so about, about 25 years ago, I was writing a book called The Human Body Shop to Steve Manchin. And um, as part of the research for that book, I heard that they were, by they, the, the United States Department of Agriculture in their Beltsville, Maryland laboratory, which is about 45 minutes outside of Washington, D.C., were uh, genetically engineering pigs with human growth genes. The idea was to have human growth genes in every cell of those pigs to create giant pigs. 
the man who was doing it was a charming fellow named uh, Dr. Vern Purcell. And he said he wanted to make a pig as big as a barn. Uh, I guess pork chops for everybody was the idea. Uh, but I was curious. I mean, I was writing a book about the genetic engineering of life and, and the patenting of life. And I, so I went out. I actually went out to Beltsville and, and, and made an appointment with Dr. Purcell because I wanted to see what his pigs looked like. Well, what was this going to... And so I, I met, uh, when I went out to uh, Beltsville, Maryland, I met pig number 6707. It was his most successful pig. Um, and he brought me into this pen where this pig was, and um, I immediately noted there were some anomalies with the pig. For one, the pig could not stand up. In order for me to photograph it for my book, I had to put it against a plywood, little plywood thing and kind of push it this way. Uh, its musculature had overwhelmed its body. It was cross-eyed. Um, and uh, he told me that it was going to infertile. And so I said to him, what happened? And he said, well, Andy, imagine if you put elephant growth genes in, a, in, a, in, a, in an embryo, human embryo, and the musculature would overwhelm the human body. That's what's happened to this animal. And I said, well, this is terrible. This is a tragic, I mean, he's suffering. This is terrible. He said, Andy, you know, the Wright brothers didn't get it, you know, the first time either. Now, it took him a few. And, uh, you know, I put that in my book. But I thought about it for a while. And I realized that, and by the way, Dr. Vern Purcell retired about five years ago. Uh, he never did successfully create a genetically engineered pig. Uh, but uh, he tried many, many times to unknown amounts of suffering for those animals. And he, was, he is now, as you can get online, you can check him out. He's in the USDA Hall of Fame. Um, so what I realized was that there is a, you know, behind a lot of what we're talking about, at this conference and what you guys do, there is ideology at work. Yes, it's profit. Uh, yes, it's part of our, our system, but there's also an ideology at work. And unless we get at the consciousness behind that ideology, here comes my sermon part. Um, you know, all the Center for Food Safety, all of our litigation, all the great work every one of you is doing out there is not going to do it. Because there's going to be too many genetically engineered plants out there. There's going to be too many pesticides out there, too many animal factories out there. What is behind this? What is, be, what, is be, what is behind this system that has us acquiesce to it, that has us be part of it? What is that? What is the consciousness that is creating the problems? Because if we only stop the bleeding, there's going to be too much wounding out there in the environment, ourselves, our health, our children's health, the health of the planet the torture of these animals. What is the consciousness that creates this, this world that we're all fighting so hard to change? So I want to spend just a few minutes talking about that and talking what, it, you know, and you, you know, I'm happy to have your input into later. This is, you know, obviously this is an opportunity for me to get a bigger picture on what I do and hopefully on what you do and we can, we can, we can dialogue on it. Um, so, what I realized was that if you, go to a, if you go to a church and they talk about evil, they're usually talking about what you might want to call hot evil. You know, lust, sins, you know, and these, are, and these do terrible things. Anger, uh, you know, uh, those sins of the heart. And that's, I would call that hot evil. People are impassioned. This would be true with terrorists. But I'm suspecting that that's not the biggest problem that we have. I think one of the biggest problems we have is something called cold evil. Dr. Purcell was not all heated and passionate. He didn't say, oh boy, do I want to torture this pig. Man, it feels good to torture this. No, not at all. He was very calm. He was very rational. He explained the science of how they're getting these human genes into each of the cells of the pig. An impressive technical feat, certainly. And if you think about cold evil, let's get beyond Purcell's experiment and let's look what happens to the 10 billion animals that we 
use every year in this country for food? Ten billion, right? And then we have something at McDonald's called the Happy Meal. That's the least happy meal. And not just because of how it affects our, our, our kids' health and our community's health, but because of what's going on there. I mean, just think about the forests that are cut down around the world for the beef culture. Think about the terror of the animals. Think of the destruction of the forests. Think of what that means for our planet's warming. Think about what's happening to those animals in the feedlots and the slaughterhouses, which shouldn't even be called houses, slaughter factories, because that's what they are. They're like the Detroit factories in reverse. That's the assembly line, that's the disassembly line. And we just, <laughs> just last week, right, the USDA said that they were not going to increase the, uh, the allowable rate of birds going through the disassembly line in the slaughter factories to one from 150 birds per minute to 175 birds being slaughtered per minute. Hmm. So what's happening? How do we partake in this? Well, we're all sitting there with, you know, you know, Ronald McDonald. So one thing I can tell you is this distance, right? Most of us live in an urban environment. I'm a New York City kid, and we're, we're, a, very, we're a very great distance from where our food is made and where these products are made, right? At a very great distance. Uh, and, this, and so in the last, in my lifetime, we've lost 10 million farmers, 5 million farms, 75% of all the creatures on the endangered species list are there because of farming or ranching. The highest suicide rate among any profession in America is farmers, by far, about four times per capita. By the way, dentists are way up there too. I guess you can only see so many teeth in a lifetime before you start. Yeah. And of course, police and psychologists are in the top 10 too, so beware of that. Maybe a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Yeah, so we, we have massive suicide among farmers. And we know what this is doing to our health. You know, it's doing to the health of our children, doing to health, uh, you know, the, the increases in cancer. And we'll get into that with pesticides in just a minute. But I think the, um, there's also an ideology behind it. Anybody here remember the Jetsons? Jetsons? What do the Jetsons eat? Remember? Big vitamin pills. But they ate it with a, a knife and fork. You know, you got to keep some traditions alive. And do you remember what they drank? This orange substance that we knew was Tang. And we liked Tang because Tang was the drink that who, who drank, remember? The astronauts drank, that's right, that was going to be the future. So think about that for a second. Think about the future of food. The future of food was supposed to be, we're going to live in these like, you know, weird sort of, you know, no air, no natural air, nothing. We're going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to eat, you know, ta vitamin tablets with our knives and forks and drink Tang. That was going to be the future of food, right? So that gives you some idea of the distancing between us and our food system and the fatal, when I said fatal harvest, and you think about all the deaths because of nutrition, all the obesity, you think of the suicides of the farmers, you think of what's happening to the 10 billion farmers, you look that we're exhausting our topsoil at 13 times the rate we can replace it, that the Agala Aquifer right now is about 40% down, so we're about 1,000 years from filling that up. When I call it fatal harvest, it's, this was not, our current system is not sustainable. And the word fatal was not rhetorical in that sense. But let's get into some of the um, psychology and ideology behind this. People keep talking about we're at the end of the age of extraction. Donald Trump doesn't realize it, but coal, gas, you name it, oil, are going to run out in the next 30 or 40, 50 years. But something people don't talk about is that we're also at the end of what I would call the age of extermination. Right? One of this system's ideologies, one of the things behind it, is if you don't fit in the system, you die. And I say, wait a minute, Eddie. I know you're giving a sermon, but that sounds a little extreme for Sunday morning. But is it really? 
So when we came to this country, by we I mean Western Europeans, a certain population didn't really fit with what they wanted to do here, did they? What did we do to them? We tried to exterminate them, right? No other way to put it. I, mean, I wish I could put it nicer. It was genocide, right? You don't fit here. That doesn't fit here. So when the industrial system, when it sees something it doesn't like, it has the ethic of extermination. Now let's take a look. So what does that mean in agriculture? What does that mean for our food supply? Well, we have these huge, 58% uh, of Americans' farmland right now is in genetically engineered corn and soy that feeds almost nobody, feeds our cars, feeds all these animal factories, goes into high fructose corn syrup, right? So 58% of our cropland is now in these genetically engineered crops and not feeding virtually anybody. So when they tell you we're feeding the world, that is a complete lie. They're feeding their bottom line. And when they say, oh, unless we have genetic engineering, we can't feed the world because we'd have to go into all these important natural areas. No, take your 58% of genetically engineered crops out there, corn and soy, turn them into nutritious food, into a variety of grains, and then we should judge our, our acreage not by yield per acre, but by nutrition per acre. By that, we're one of the worst countries in the world. But what happens when you have these huge monocultures? Plants that we call weeds grow in. They don't fit the system, do they? Even if they're nutritious, right? Even if they're milkweed, which the butterflies require for their survival. So what do we do to them? We exterminate them, right? And what about those insects that don't fit with a system? What do you do to them? <laughs> and we spray insecticides, right? So when we have these huge monocultures that encourage weeds, that encourage fungi, that encourage insects. We use these pesticides, right? But are they really pesticides? Rachel Carson, in the last page of um, Silent Spring, one of my great heroes, by the way, um, says that the entire industrial agricultural system is based on Neanderthal biology, right? That's the idea that if you don't like something in nature, you can kill it and it's going to work. Right? Well, that was their idea, right? So they call them pesticides. Now, if, if you look at this, just for, for those who are not totally familiar with it, so you've got pesticides, that's the big frame. Under pesticides, you've got insecticides, supposed to kill insects. You've got herbicides, killing your weeds. You've got fungicides, kill all those fungi that we, we don't seem to like. And then you've got rodenticides that kill your rats and mice and rodents. So those are the four categories. Insecticides, herbicides, rodenticides and fungicides under the labeling pesticides. So sometimes that's confusing because they'll call a herbicide a pesticide and an insecticide a pesticide. And you get, so if you want to sort of clear that up in your head, there you go. But are they really pesticides? So for example, an insecticide, these neonicotinoids that I just talked to you about our victory on, they kill the bees. They're not really good at killing anything else actually. And they're very ineffective because the way they use these, these systemic pesticides is they coat the seeds with them. And then when the rain comes, the, the, uh, it's like an M&M. &M. The coating goes off and then goes into every cell of the plant, but about 95% of it just washes into our rivers where it's killing uh, a lot of the insect life that we require for, for our uh, fish life. But it's also killing the bees. Are the bees pests? No. Hmm. So Roundup is supposed to kill the weeds, right? Monsanto's Roundup. And it's killing milkweed. Is milkweed a pest? And the monarch butterflies in their three-generation journey to come across the country, and we just got, thank God, the Department of Interior to begin to look at the monarchs as an endangered species through a lot of effort and work by my staff. Um, are the monarch butterflies a pest? No. And clopyrifos and a number of other pesticides that my organization, along with NRDC and a few others, had finally gotten the Obama administration to say they were going to ban because it destroys the brains of children. It's a toxic to, to the brains of our children. Are our children pests? So what do we call them pesticides for? It doesn't seem to be very accurate, does it? No. I mean, humans aren't pests. I know there's exceptions in Washington right now. I'm talking about the vast number of humans, not the few that are pests. Um, yeah, they're really biocides. We should never call them pesticides. They're biocides. 
they kill all life. And there is no, the, the, the great unity of life between plants and animals, including the human animal, is there so that these biocides kill us all. But not only are they incredibly dangerous, but who's going to bat last? Well, let's take antibiotics. What's happening with antibiotics? What, what happens to the bugs? They get resistant, don't they? We have all these antibiotic-resistant bugs right now, right? And it's a real threat. I mean, it's a, you know, to, I mean, the whole medical, the whole medical paradigm is also based on this extermination. If there's a bad bacteria in there, what are we going to do? We're going to kill all your bacteria. <laughs> but we're going to get that one. We're going to exterminate it. Well, that's not going to work because the bugs have gotten used to it. The bugs are resistant. And so, what are we, what, what are we, where are we going with that now in our society? In a good direction. What's it called? Probiotics. We're saying we're going to get away from this whole mindset of extermination and this whole culture of death. And we're going to say instead of killing that which we don't like in our system, we are going to build and create a better environment for the positive bacteria. Hmm. It's a whole change in thought, isn't it? You see the shift in that paradigm? And right now, we are at peak herbicide. Roundup was the only broad spectrum, relatively, and believe me, it's a cancer causer, so it's not uh, non-toxic, but relatively non-toxic. There are no other Roundups. So right now, the Monsanto, the reason they're doing all these mergers is the, that their entire business, Monsanto, is based on selling these Roundup-ready crops. But now the weeds don't die when you spray Roundup on them. They're resistant. 60% right, of our farmland now has these super weeds. Can't kill them with Roundup, and there's no new Roundup, just like antibiotics. So what are they doing? They're going back to Agent Orange. Dow says we're going to be selling Agent Orange tolerant corn. Yeah, why not? You know, Vietnam, a long time ago. And then Monsanto said, oh no, we don't want you to inherit our business now that Roundup doesn't work anymore. We're going to go with Dicamba. Dicamba is one of the most toxic, and, 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 and Dicamba is a big problem. And by the way, we're in litigation to stop both of these approvals right now. That canvas real problem is that after you spray it, and if it's warm and moist, it comes back up in a cloud. This is a herbicide that kills anything that's green and will move a mile. So if you've got your organic, uh, you know, apple orchard two miles from this field, it comes down and kills you, it'll kill everything on your apple orchard. There are literally dozens of suits all around the country now because of Monsanto's dicamba. The, here you are, your farmer, you've been working on your farm for years and years and years, and you wake up in the morning, you look outside, and your whole farm's dead. The state of Arkansas, hardly the center of organic agriculture in this country, has now banned dicamba. Banned it because of this. So they're in trouble. Nature bats last. And for you baseball fans out there, it bats a thousand. So when I said before that we were going to win, it was kind of a little bit of a misnomer. Because nature is going to win. And if we ally ourselves with nature's way, we will win with it. But let me go into what happened to the Jetsons. Jetsons, we're not living in Jetson world, are we? What happened? Well, what happened was that a lot of people said, we don't want to live this way. A lot of people in this room a lot of people that I work with, and we said, no, we're not going to go that way. We're not going to go the Jetson way. We're not going to go with this great distancing, this psychological distancing. And let me just quickly talk about that psychological distancing. We, we saw this sort of, this, with, Vin, with Purcell, we saw this efficiency drive. We see this, you know, if you love efficiency, you'll always end up by wanting to support compulsion including elimination. Do people here know what efficiency, you know the definition of efficiency? Maximum input, right? Minimum effort, sorry, maximum output for minimum effort and minimum time. Maximum output for minimum effort and minimum time. Our entire industrial agriculture system, our entire system is based on that efficiency. You know, the minute manager, I think there's the nanosecond manager out there somewhere, right? 
That is one of the great ethics behind what I talked to this cold deal, that we have to have an efficient society. Right? What if I were to tell you, which is true, that I have a daughter and a son, Kailani and Nicholas, and I treat them very efficiently? A uh, minimum input of affection and attention for maximum good grades and good behavior. Good parent? Terrible parent, right. right. I love dogs, and my dogs, my relationship with my dogs is the most inefficient relationship imaginable. I lavish love, affection, and care on these animals who produce no work, no value whatsoever. You know, they pee on the rug occasionally or chew a baseball glove, but they, they you know, it's, it's, it's a horrifyingly inefficient relationship. And, you know, imagine being an efficient friend. You know, three in the morning. Andy, this is Cindy. Joe left again. You know, I know you got your degree in psychology. Can you help me out here? Sorry, I have a talk to give tomorrow in Melville, New York. That would be an inefficient conversation for me. We treat through our agricultural system and our entire industrial system, we treat living things, all of nature, including ourselves, based on efficiency. Efficiency is a great ethic for a machine. It's a terrible ethic to treat anything that's living, whether that means us or those 175 chickens per minute that are efficiently going through that animal factory. It is devastating. It is one of the great pinnacles of cold evil. It is this belief in efficiency, this mistaking life as machine, and this is, by the way, written into our laws. We can now patent animals and plants as machines. I fought it unsuccessfully. You hear I won on DNA, but I have not yet won. We have not yet won on plants or animals. They are still considered patentable machines under Section 101 of the U.S. Patent Act. So this isn't just you know, philosophy 01 or sermon 01. This is actually written to our laws. And thousands of plants and animals have been patented as machines. The worst I saw was at Texas A&M. They patented the beagle, the beagle, the dog, because they found that beagles were very obedient in laboratory circumstances when they were being experimented on. So they patented the obedience of the beagle. We challenged that patent in court, and we also went down to uh, Texas A&M and got the students there to put beagle stickers everywhere, <laughs> including all over the car of the regents. So everywhere they went, they saw beagles. They gave up that patent voluntarily after, the, after our lawsuit. But so we treat, if, so what, if we don't treat, if we don't treat living things with efficiency, what do we treat living things with? What, what is, what, how should we treat living things? Love, kindness, respect, empathy. We know the answer. We just don't live it. You know, and I don't always live it. I mean, when I, when I testify in Congress, you heard that I do. When I go and argue in front of the Supreme Court, I very rarely use that language, to be honest with you. People talk about efficient use of natural resources. Isn't that what you're supposed to be? You know, I have worked with hundreds of environmental attorneys, hundreds of, of attorneys working for animal welfare over my, you know, 45 years of working on this. And um, I have yet to have one come up to me and say, you know how I got into this, Andy? I devoted my life to animal welfare, devoting my life to human health is because I want to see more efficient use of natural resources or, or more efficient, and never, never one. It's because they love those animals. It's because they love those mountains. It's because they respect. We've lost that language with this efficiency thing. And by the way, when we talk about, you, you know, people always say, Andy, you know, humans are so arrogant. You know, we treat the whole world efficiently. You know, we're like, we're the big lords. Like, we're the big gods. I go, I don't really buy that. Because the system treats us the same way it treats the rest of us, right? I mean, 60 million of us are on psychotropic medication to get through the day. 80 million of us are on some kind of medication to try and get sleep at night. It's really clear that this system doesn't fit our circadian rhythms, doesn't fit our lives either. If you have to be medicated, oh, and by the way, 500,000 children, 500,000 children that are in preschool or in the first two grades are also on psychotropic medication to get through our school day. 
we have clearly also had a, quote, efficient system of work, efficient school system that has nothing to do with respect, love, and empathy for the human system, for our relationship to be able to participate. So people say, you think we're going to genetically engineer humans, Andy? And I go, we don't need to. We're already being chemically engineered by the tens of millions in order to comport with this system. Sometimes you're depressed because it's very depressing to work in a system that doesn't respect you and doesn't respect who you are. Sometimes you're anxious because it's a blood sport in this country. If you lose your job, you lose your house and you have to move in and it's very anxiety provoking. It's not your fault. It's the system was not made for your emotional, spiritual, psychological well-being. It was made for the efficiency of their profits and the efficiency of their machines. And that's cold evil. And it's cold evil when millions of kids with all sorts of ideals and callings have to go into a work system that lets them and forces them to spend decades of their lives in work that is not meaningful or important to them, but work that simply increases the efficiency of the machine of the system. Right. So that's one of the great pillars. Let me go to another great pillar, competition. Now I coach baseball. I'm very proud that my little league team was the champion down at Virginia. Um, I think competition has a place. Just like efficiency has a place with machines, competition is fun. Competition is great. But what if, it's, what if it's your governing ethic? Right? Capitalism. What's the basis of capitalism? Supply and demand. Now, how do you govern supply and demand through? Competition. All right, let's go back to my kids, shall we? Nicholas and Kailani. And I say, okay, guys, competition here. So, Nick, what'd you get in your report card? Hey, Dad, you know, I have an A minus average. That's good, Nick. Kailani, what'd you get? It's just a B, B minus, Dad. Kailani, you are the weakest link. Goodbye. <laughs> what? Just preparing them for the real world, aren't I? Take a look at all the shows on television that reify, that valorize competition. I mean, I love to cook. Do people here love to cook? You ever look at this cooking channel? I look at it, I mean, when I'm doing my workout in the morning, I usually took it. By the way, it's always better if you haven't eaten. Cooking channel is always really nice if you haven't eaten, because really, if you've already eaten, eh, that's not so much. Fun. But do you know how much competition? What, you know, all these competitions on these shows, what are they called? You know, like um, um, Chopped. Ever, you see that show, Chopped? I mean, you, you've got to try and make a really nice dinner in like 20 minutes efficiency, and who wins or loses, you know, and oh, I want to give $10,000 to my mom. Ah, oh, you lost, sorry, you got chopped. They turn everything into a, an efficiency-based competition. Everything, the stock market, everything is based on competition, right? And I remember when, when President Clinton, when we, when we signed NAFTA, he said, we have to do this to show that we are going to win in the global competition, economic competition. We're going to win, America. Finally, we're winners again. You may have heard that recently from a president. And I was wondering, is that OK? Do we really want Mexico to be the loser? Do we really want the Philippines to be the loser and have mass unemployment and have starvation? No environmental regs. No, is that really, is that, is that, that good? Is that, that where we are? Rollo May, the great psychologist, said the competition is the ethic of isolation. It isolates you against everyone else in a blood sport for survival. And the terrible thing about it, and most of, many of us have experienced this, I know I have, is that when you lose in this competitive game, this blood sport, when our society has become, and even worse under the current regime, it doesn't, you don't drop out. You just try and work harder. And that's sad because everything from the bedroom to the boardroom now is competitive. We're all like competitive commodities at the, you know, looking for the date, looking, you know, getting online. Everyone's in a commodity trying to sell yourself to a boss, trying to sell yourself to a college, trying to sell your child to a private kindergarten versus the other kids. Everything is competition. Everything is based on that. And that's certainly the ethic of the current administration. What's, 
Is that how we should treat living things, whether they be our plants, animals, ourselves, our children? What should, what, what's the, op that's cold evil. What's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the ethic we should be treating with? Cooperation, what else? That's great. Cooperation, I think, is the primary one, yeah. But also care, care and cooperation, right? Empathy, right? I'm with you. I walk in your shoes. I don't try and take your shoes. Now, you know, I, you can check this out. I, uh, this recently was up on Huffington Post last week or two weeks ago. I don't know. I wrote a piece, and it's important, I think, in this, to try and change this ethic, where I mentioned that if you look at everybody in America who gets up to take care of something, not to make more money, and by the way, organic people make profit, a lot of the good people here making profit, on their, that's, I'm not saying profit is always bad, certainly not. But putting that aside, all the people that get up in the morning to take care, which means to protect, to maintain, to care for something or someone or something in our country, it's about 40 million adults. Many more than are in manufacturing, many more than are in finance. Yeah. That's all the people that, we, that are out there, like my organization, all the NGOs out there, that's, that's the 14 million stay at, voluntarily stay-at-home moms and dads. That's our military. That's all the firemen, that's all the policemen. It's all the people that are working in our parks, all the people that are working the nurses, all the social workers. No, they're not getting up every morning to try and be competitive with anybody. They're getting up as part of America's care community. 40 million strong. When was the last time you saw a television show on that? When was the last time you saw them honored? And then go back and see how many channels tomorrow are going to be devoted to the stock market, competition, Sports. So efficiency has to be balanced with empathy and love when dealing with anything that's living. And any organic farmer, any farmer I work with, that's, they love their land. They love what they do. And competition has to be balanced with cooperation, empathy, and mutual respect. That's how we can look at this, this change in consciousness. And there's a couple of other things. One of the other problems that we have that is really behind a lot of this, and this Vern Purcell told me too, he said, Andy, unless we do this, you see pigs just are not in and of themselves good enough. They don't represent progress, right? So let's take a look at progress, because people often assume that progress means more genetic engineering, more patenting, more free market, well, to me, progress is an incomplete sentence. What does progress mean? What does progress mean to you? Progress towards what? Right? That's the question you have to answer. When I go to colleges and I lecture and I talk to these college kids, they have lost the capacity quite often to imagine that they can actually redefine progress to something that they want, a society that they would actually want to live in. Well, that's tragic. Because that is the question. Progress doesn't exist. It's, a, it's an incomplete sentence. Progress towards what? It's like when somebody says to you, hey, my friend Charlie made good. And you wait and you wait. He says, what's the matter? Made good what? Shoes, poems, crops, food? Incomplete sentence. Is a world full of genetically engineered crops that feed virtually no one? Is a world where 10 billion animals suffer unconscionable torture every day? Is that progress? No. No. And that's one of the great things about organic. Organic says no to the three great technologies of modernity. It says no to chemicals. It says no to biotechnology. And it says no to radiation. Well, those are three great technologies the last 150 years. Organic says no. And then organic has the nerve to say, and that, my friends, is progress. So when you buy organic, you aren't just buying a much better product for the earth and for yourselves. And it is a much better product. It's a product that's not going to have clopyrifos. It's not going to uh, interfere with your child's brain development. It's not going to give you uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Or, it, it, it's not, that's a terribly important. 
and certainly important for this conference, I realize that, but you're also making a statement saying, no, we are redefining progress. We are redefining through our dollar, through, we are redefining what we mean by progress by saying we want to be closer with nature, we want to participate with nature. We are not going to participate in the ethic of extermination. We're not going to participate in treating life as machine through efficiency, and we are not going to live in a world of, of we're, we're going to live in a world of co-ops, literally agricultural co-ops and food co-ops. So those are a few of the pillars of my sermon. The last one really gets to me a little bit because uh, my good friend Ralph Nader, people here know Ralph Nader, yes? I know, 2000, wasn't great. But he's still a really good friend and a teacher of mine and uh, helped get me get into the legal work I do. But Ralph invented a term I don't like, which is the consumer. Right, you're all consumers, right? You like being consumers? You know what they used to call tuberculosis? Consumption, why? Because they ate the bodies of their victims. Fires consume. What a terrible, cold, evil way to think of just all of us as mass consumers. You see in all these horrifying telev television commercials where for some reason everyone's dancing. No I don't know anybody who dances anymore, sadly. But everyone's dancing on television commercials and all these adults are acting like nine-year-olds. <laughs> Stupid consumers. If you, if you watch the inculcation of this, it's really amazing. Now, whether we like it or not, in this cold evil system that we talked about, whether it be the animals, whether it be the killing through the, 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 the biocides, we are, through every choice you and I make, every day, every day, we are either increasing this cold evil system of industrial agriculture or finding a new, this new alternative of organic and beyond. Every choice we make. You may not, you may, I don't, I'm not always saying I'm on the top of that mountain. I'm just saying this is not just an environmental crisis. It's not just a human health issue. It is a moral issue on which you decide. If you eat industrial meat today, you have become part of that system. You're not a mere consumer. You are a creator. One way or the other, you are creating a different future for your body, for your children, for your community, for these animals, and for the earth. I mean, when you talk about healthy food, healthy human, healthy planet, that, yes, that's, that's, that's our motto and a lot of other people's motto, but it's also a moral choice, a moral choice that we all have to make. And if you lose it one day, that's okay, like any other one, like any, like, you know, like any other sermon, you can be saved tomorrow. And that's the great thing about this food issue. That is the great thing about this food issue, which is that you can make choices today. You can make choices. I can make choices that affect the whole system. That's not true whether we stay in Afghanistan war. It's not true even about nuclear power. It's not true about how we can affect a lot of their energy grid. But it is true of food. We can all make those choices. We are, that's what makes us such an exciting, exciting field to work in that I've been working in for so many years, is that you can empower, you can change. I would never have dreamed 10 years ago that you would walk into an Exxon station and see four different types of organic milk. I would never have dreamed that I would turn on the TV last night and see not one, but five different commercials, including a pet food commercial that said non-GMO. Now we're making a lot of progress. Now let me get a little more specific here at the end, and then we'll go to questions. Um, one of the problems I think that we face is it's not always clear what the alternative is. You know, you say, well, I get it. I mean, I, I know organic's good, but I mean, you know, organic sort of tells us what not to do. I mean, how, how, am I, how do I get, I want healthy food, I want a healthy person, I want a healthy planet, but what does it actually mean? It just sort of goes away and it's kind of diaphanous. So let's do this together in about three minutes. Let, let's figure out the future of agriculture in about three minutes. You ready for that? I know we can do this. Trust me. I've done it before. All right. So let's take a look, and this is admittedly somewhat simplified, but let, what do you need to grow a healthy plant that would, would make us healthy in a way that's healthy for the planet? What do you need? Soil, got it. What else? Water, great. What else do we need? Sunlight, perfect. Now, sunlight's usually a light later one. Okay, what else? Okay, 
We can go with air and not go with air. We do need air, absolutely. But yeah, we, we'll throw air in there. Okay, so, so far we've got soil. All right? We've got water. We've got sunlight. We've got air. What else do we need? What do you put in the ground? Seeds. Yeah. Sorry. It's early. Come on. It's Sunday and it's early. Come on, guys. Late Saturday night. Okay, what else do you need? Who puts the... Farmers, right? And what else? What about the, what about the terrible thing these neonics do? Pollinators, right? Remember, one out of every three bites of food you take is there because of a pollinator, right? And in certain areas, we need nitrogen. What is a natural source of nitrogen? Animals, right? There you go. I call it the essentials. Not too difficult. You could write it down. Probably remember it. So here's the question. When I talk about the industrial agriculture being unsustainable, and you hear that a lot, hey, it's unsustainable. Hey, it's unsustainable. Let's go through and see if that's true or not. Or am I just BSing? Yes, I can say BSing on stage. It's okay. <laughs> the, uh, as long as you don't say it the whole thing on. All right, so how are we doing with, what do we start with? Oh, how are we doing with soil? How are we doing with topsoil? Great, right? Industrial agriculture is wonderful for topsoil, right? It's horrible for topsoil. <laughs> We're destroying a topsoil about 13 to 15 times. I said the rate it can replace itself. And so what do we do when we don't have enough nitrogen from the natural soil? What do we do? We put on synthetic fertilizers. But they're okay, right? They're horrible. Right? Synthetic fertilizers, I mean, they're causing dead zones the size of Connecticut. They're destroying our, 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 our entire uh, uh, delta ecosystems. They're destroying the, uh, the uh, bringing algae and, and bacteria into, into city water systems. They're contributing hugely to climate change. Wow. So soil didn't work out so well. But the good news is that industrial agriculture uses water really well. No, it's horrible for water. Industrial agriculture is exhausting water. The beef culture alone, right, has destroyed the Colorado River. You know all the statistics about literally 120 gallons of water required for each of those Big Macs we talked about. That's another reason it's an unhappy meal. It's destroying our water systems, right? And then on top of that, we have all these, these, these biocides that are poisoning the aquifer. And as I said, the Agalala aquifer is down 40%. It takes 1,500 years for that to build up. So it's a disaster. I mean, the West right now, the Colorado River, by the time it gets to Mexico, it doesn't exist anymore. Not just the aquifers. These are rivers. Yikes. Well, the good news, though, is that we're doing, that we're doing fine with seeds. We have this huge diversity of seeds that industrial... No, no. Actually, in my lifetime again, according to the uh, FAO of the UN, we've lost 80 to 90% of our vegetable and fruit seeds. Now, some of those, thank God, are being saved. And by the way, I, I, please, any gardeners out there, get on our website. We have a, a seed-saving website. We, we are taking, we've done this now uh, for about a year, but we have all these amazing people. It's like a dating site for seed savers and gardeners and small farmers, except you don't date. You, you exchange seeds, and you get to talk to each other and exchange seeds. So please get on the Center for Food Safety website. You'll see that. It's our international seed-saving network and become part of it. It's a great thing to be on. I'm on it. We, you, you can get all these great seeds from people for free. It's nonprofit. We're not, no one's getting a dollar on it. But we're just using it as a platform to save these seeds. Monoculturing of seeds is a terrible problem, not only because we love the diversity and the beauty and the taste of different foods, but also because we live in a climate change world where we don't know what seeds are going to work in any given part of the world in the next 50 years. We're going to need all that diversity for our food security but not through the industrial agriculture, we're not. they're monoculturing it more and more every day and they're patenting, right? The whole point right now, Monsanto owns 26% of all the world's commercial seeds. And if you add Syngenta, Bayer, now that's about 66% of all the world's commercial seeds are owned by three chemical companies. And they don't use those seeds. They deep six them so they won't be competitive with their GMO and other varieties. They are cornering the seed market to not use those seeds so they can have the world's farmers only buy their very few seeds they have out there. So that's why this kind of seed network we're doing and others hopefully joining us and seed libraries around the country, 
they're getting more and more popular, thank God, and that's why they really need it. So seas didn't work out, soil didn't work out, water, what about the sun? We doing okay with the sun? Now we have somehow turned the sun into an enemy. We know for the magic of photosynthesis and you know, you can go to the most sophisticated extension schools of USDA. We still don't understand photosynthesis. It is still an alchemical process that scientists don't even understand. And yet there it is, the sun somehow, and then you have the chlorophyll and the sugars, and that of course feeds the soil. Wow, it's magical, right? So we turn the sun into an enemy. And how, do, how, do, how are we doing with the pollinators? Right? We lost 80% of our bees last year. We represent beekeepers in our lawsuits, and it's tragic what's happening to our pollinators. It's gotten so bad in China that they have people actually pollinating, trying to pollinate it. Farmers, I mentioned, 10 million farmers lost in my lifetime, 5 million farms lost, huge monocultures, these foreclosures causing this massive suicide across the country with farmers. It's just absolute, and farm communities, if you travel through Iowa as I did about a year ago with one of my board members who's a, a farmer there, it's horrible. Schools closed up, communities gone, it's just a nightmare and full of these toxic pesticides, can't drink the water, can't take a shower, it, it, the water is so contaminated, it's, it's a terrible, terrible thing. But at least we're using the animals right, we're using the animals in a way to give more nutrition to the soil, right? Now, we've got 10 billion animals, these animal factories, what do they do with the waste? It becomes these huge lagoons, not useful for anything except contaminating aquifers, contaminating groundwater, but they also bring out something that helps climate change get worse, methane. So when I tell you that this system is a nightmare and it will not continue, it will end one way or the other, I ain't kidding. We just went through the essentials, folks. That's it. There's, there, it's not airy, uh -huh, hug tree huggy. No, that's it. Those are the essentials. You blow those, we don't live here anymore. And we take a lot of the freaking planet with us. Not good, bad. Well, what's the answer? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. It's just a little hard to get there, which is we obviously cannot use topsoil at a rate that exceeds its ability to regenerate itself. You probably heard this new term everyone's using, you know, regenerative agriculture. Well, this is what it means. I'm not sure it's the right term. We can talk about that. But this is where we are. We need to say, hey, we cannot use topsoil. And by the way, the USDA is doing a great job on this. Tremendous progress being made on bioremediation of soil. We're doing lots of projects in Hawaii. You can get on our website. We're doing a lot of soil remediation. We're really deep into the soil work. It's really important if we're going to make it as, as, as a race here. And so then water the same way. We cannot use water more than it can regenerate itself. That sounds obvious, right? But wait a minute. Let's go back a second. Remember I talked about this system of supply and demand? How does that fit with regeneration? Let's think about that. Okay. I, you know, I've never understood it, but for some reason tuna fish is, everyone loves tuna fish, right? And as we get more and more population, we want more and more tuna fish. But thank goodness the tuna fish know that, so they know there's the laws of supply and demand, so they keep reproducing themselves to fit the supply and demand, right? <laughs> Why? They don't? You see, they didn't read Adam Smith. Yeah, in 1776, they must have been doing something else on the Wealth of Nations. No, as a matter of fact, nothing in nature reproduces according to Mr. Smith's or our capitalist supply and demand. Nothing. It has its own rhythm. They all have their own rhythm, their own way of regenerating. And if we don't understand a lot sooner than later that our entire economic system has to be a subset of ecological laws, and we can't have this sort of system that is completely disembedded from, from this regeneration, again, that is this big paradigm shift. We can talk about the specifics, and the litigation, everything else, but unless we make these paradigm shifts and begin to really think about this the way I'm talking about, I don't think we're going to get where we need to go here. So we need to, that's true with soil, it's true with water, right? With seeds, we, we know diversity is the way. And it's so interesting, we always talk about right now, especially with the... Um, uh, with our churlish president 
and his you know, white supremacy followers, how important diversity is for all of us. I mean, look at this audience, incredibly diverse, wonderfully diverse, right? But it's just the same with seeds, just the same with nature. That diversity is our strength. That's what gives us, you know, if you have a corn blight and you only have one type of corn, that wipes out your whole crop. That did wipe out our whole crop in the 1970s, for those who are familiar with that history. We had to get uh, corn from South America to, for our corn crop to survive. We'd so monocultured it. So diversity equals strength. Diversity is not deficiency. Whether that be in politics, whether you're talking about immigration, whether you're talking about people, never let them say diversity equals deficiency or difference equals deficiency. Diversity equals strength. Another one of those sort of pillar ideas. And we know that we have to completely disband the industrial uh, factory system, and to the extent that we have animals, they have to be back on the land, and they have to be done in, in, a, uh, in a, what we used to be called husbandry, which has to be in a system that, that works. And of course, our pollinators, you know, obviously, our bio, we have to stop the use of our biocides. So I call this the organic and beyond future. And what do I mean by organic and beyond? Organic is the floor for the future. We believe, CFS, that organic should be the floor of all American agriculture. It's the most rapidly growing sector in American agriculture right now. It's a multi, multi-billion dollar industry, but it's just the floor. It tells you what not to do. So above that, we want to build a house, a future of food that is local, that's appropriate in scale, that's humane, you know how um, deeply I feel that, that's biodiverse, and that's socially just. And that will also make it climate friendly, all of those things. So local, appropriate scale, biodiverse, humane, and socially just. That's, and right now I'm working with a number of foundations and a number of things to try and build those rules together, create new labels, new market incentives, new policy incentives to make that happen. But I think behind it all has to be this understanding then each of us, including me, every day, psychologically, spiritually, personally, as we concern ourselves with our health and the health of the planet, and the health of our children, we also realize that we need to nurture those consciousness and psychological and spiritual aspects of ourselves that say efficiency is fine for that, but I want to bring love and empathy into my life and my feeling about the planet and my circle of empathy, not just, my circle of empathy isn't just for my kids, isn't just for my family, it includes the animals that are suffering, the people that are suffering, the forests that are cutting down. My, I'm, 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 it's painful, but I'm big enough to say that because unless I have that, unless I fall in love and, and feel that empathy, I'm not gonna do much about it. We protect that which we love. Unless you widen that circle of love, you aren't going to protect those things. You won't. You'll be like a, women out there, you'll be like, or men too, you, men will be tiger, will be tigresses to defend your kids, which is great. But that's not good enough right now. Not for the world we live in. And we have to begin to look at each other as difficult as it is, as we looked at each other as children often, and not look at each other as competitors, fighting for that last grant, fighting for the promotion, fighting for tenure, just fighting for a job. We have to begin to come together, restore things like unions and cooperatives and certainly food cooperatives that make that happen. And then ultimately, we have to have the courage, all of us together, to redefine progress and say progress does not lie in that direction of industrial food, of industrial cruelty, of the ethic of extermination, it lies in the organic and beyond future based in love and empathy, based in respect, based in cooperation, and based in the fact that each of us every day takes on the responsibility for ourselves, for our communities, for our children, the planet, that we are creators and not consumers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have time for some questions, and you can ask, don't, you don't have to, you can ask about GMOs, anything, or organic, anything you want. Yes, right here in the front row. 
Mm. That's a good question. Thank you for the water. Um, www. I guess you knew that. Center for Food Safety, all one word. Center for Food Safety. Org. www.centerforfoodsafety.org and everything I've talked about as far as GMOs, as far as organic, as far as our litigations, as far as our seed saving network, as far as our soil program and our climate program, they're all there. Um, and including any, you know, virtually anything I discussed will be on that website. You'll be able to catch up. And by the way, you can become a member of CFS like you can become a participant in this conference for free. We do not charge for membership. And that way you'll get our, our updates, you'll get our alerts. We do not share our list with anyone. You will not suddenly find yourself, you know, having Walmart suddenly on your, you know, Gmail. Uh, we, we do not sell it. We do not loan it. So um, without your permission, we will never use your name. So feel free, please get on it. Please become CFS members. And you can communicate to, on, with me as well over that. Other questions? In the back. To use the during World War II when they were weak from all the food that was being processed and everything is sent to them that uh, that they asked the American public to create victory gardens and sent that food to them. I think we need today to be able to do that and understand that our children are our soldiers and we need to do that for them and then that way we can have a whole community doing the things that we should do and be producers instead of consumers. That's a great Great point. As a matter of fact, uh, about <laughs> too many years ago to mention, uh, Jeremy Rifkin, a great comrade of mine for many, many years, a wonderful writer and, uh, on these issues, um, got me involved in genetic engineering in the middle 80s. He and I thought of starting a new victory garden thing even in the 80s. It's a great idea. You know the number one hobby in America? Gardening. And one of the failures of the Center for Food Safety, my organization, and any other I know of is that we don't effectively organize the garden clubs and the garden communities in the way that you're suggesting, which I think would be a phenomenal idea. And uh, it's, I mean, uh, my wife is a master gardener. It, I know the difference it makes for you, even if you have a very small area, it makes, it, it can make a really big difference. Uh, so thank you for that suggestion. It's a great suggestion. It's something I, I want to keep working on. So anybody else wants to keep working, let's, let's talk about that. The second part of your thing is something that I really, I, I I really like as well because this idea of being a creator, I, I restricted in my uh, talk here, I restricted it to being a creator in, in the manner and the food that you, you know, grow, the food, but it's actually bigger than that. It is, you know, consumer isn't just about your food choices. We become consumers in almost everything, you know? So don't just listen to music, make music. Don't just read poetry, write poetry. You don't have to be a professional, just write it, right? Don't, don't just look on the Discovery Channel, get out into nature. <laughs> you know, actually walk, experience nature, you know, get to know the trees, get to know your backyard, fall in love with that part of it. And, you know, don't just, uh, just, don't just read romance novels. You know where I'm going with that. <laughs> Other questions? You're in the front. I want to thank you because out of all the speakers, you have really brought to me, especially, a message of hope. And the hope is in your pillars and our ability to see ourselves as consumers. And when we begin to look at ourselves and our actions throughout the day and what we eat and what we buy, that's the beginning. Great what you're doing. Now, I want to say that also, the next upcoming generation, despite everything that's going on, and this is it's almost like a genocide, what's going on, but you have brought a message of hope. And talking about the gardens, I was just asked to be a nature coordinator for preschool. Mm. And my goal, I feel, the next upcoming young generation, we have to grab them and get them grounded back into the earth. And to the animals and also to gardening because the first thing I asked is do you have room at your school for a garden because that's where I want to get them out first in the garden 
growing, teaching them about seeds. We should be doing this for all our children, our grandchildren, because if we don't do it, they are going to get lost in cyberspace, and they're going to get so caught up in this matrix of lies. And um, so that's, that's how I feel. I feel getting to the children, and, and you've helped me a great deal, because I've always been trying to put my finger on what's really going on. I know what's going on, but I, now I can see the bigger picture along with the help of this, this gentleman who just spoke about the gardens. He's tremendous. He has tremendous intis, insight into where it all begins and how we change it. So well, thank, thank you. you. So thank very you very much. much. And um, the, the um, yeah, the, the, uh, and one of, my, uh, one of my things you can get online, uh, it's called, actually, it's called, this one is called Cold Evil. And it's, you'll see, uh, I go into a much larger frame than I, I did today. But, the, uh, I call it techno cocooning. You know, one of the, one of the, this cold evil system, what it loves to do is it catches you in a techno cocoon where you're never outside of technology mediating your experience with anything. And these kids today, whether it be the phone, whether it be, you know, I mean, we're in such a, they don't, I mean, in the old days, if somebody would walk down the street like screaming, you'd assume that they needed, you know, some help. Now it's just somebody talking, you know. I mean, I remember the first few times, it was very disoriented the first time I saw it. What's the matter with that person? Oh, I see, you know. But we're so surrounded. I mean, the time that these children are spending in front of screens is just terrible. When you add, you know, television and you add uh, the internet and all those games, I mean, you're talking about 10, 8, 10 hours a day. Plus, quite now, because our good friend Robert Gates, who knows nothing about agriculture and nothing about human psychology, he wants to put these things even in preschools and uh, in times with the developing brain. You know, so the first time you see a duck is on a thing that says three ducks, press the number three, versus actually seeing a duck. Now, what we've done in Hawaii, through my office in Hawaii, we have a huge school garden program. Please look that up. We, uh, through our good friend Nancy Redfeather, we, I think we're up to about 150 school gardens in the state of Hawaii, and now we're moving that into California. But they, I, I, I wish I had more expertise on this, but my staff and these people do, they have ways to do it, teaching curricula, all sorts of ways to do that. Of course, it's centered in the soil and seed. And that's really important because in the techno, you know, society that we're, this cold evil society we're talking about, people's normal relationship to all food is where? The supermarket, fast food restaurant, that's, that's the phenomenological horizon where people meet food, where most of us meet food, right? We have to, just as you say, so you said so well, we have to move that down to the soil and the seed and the essentials. That's the job. That's the educational job we have to do. They have to understand the essentials, work with it, feel it. Nothing feels better than really good soil. It's not dirt. Soil, as you all know, is just unbelievable. It's just phenomenal. And so, and kids love seeds. When I was traveling to Ethiopia about six years ago, every uh, grammar school, every high school has mandatory composting as a mandatory course and seed identification. This is Ethiopia. We should be doing the same thing. And you're right, getting kids as early as possible to experience that as, long, as well as outdoor labs, anything that gets them to nature. Again, as they grow up, they will only protect that which they love. And if that happens to be nothing but you know, the iPhone or the, the droid, and then we've, we've lost them in cyberspace, as you said so well. One last question, comment, over here. We live in, this, we live in a society now like you explained, that has really warped ideas. I mean, we, we think of somebody as being successful as somebody who was able to take our president, for example. He's a very successful businessman. But people don't look at how he became successful. And then millions of people, thousands of people he put out of work just to profit for himself. I mean, we, we make people our idols because they're successful, but we don't look at how they became successful. And we have all these changes going on. You're saying that, you know, we're going to change things and things are starting to change. But have we come too far? Is, is there going to be a point where we're finally going to save the water, but it's too late to save the water because there's no water left to save? I mean, where is that cutoff point? When are we going to get to that point? I mean, there's a lot of things we can do to change the way people think about who's successful and who's not. That takes time. It takes 
20, 30, 40 years to change people's ideas. It takes a whole generation. Do we have that much time left for some of these things before the bees are all gone, before the water's gone? Is there still time? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I, I, I was brought up in uh, Jamaica, Queens, uh, my Catholic school. St. Elizabeth was only three blocks towards Hillside Boulevard from the Trump house. My, bro uh, my brother's paper route of the Long Island Press that was then uh, still being uh, printed uh, was the Trump folks. Yeah, I, it would always peeves me off as people like Trump who were born on third base think it's such a great deal that they got home where most people aren't even in the stadium. Uh, so <laughs> that just, but you're right, how do we re redefine successful? What does it mean to be successful psychologically? What does it mean to be successful as a person? What does that actually mean? It's got to be based in relationship. There's one thing that I should have emphasized more in my talk is that it's all about relationship. The ethic of extermination is not about relationship. Efficiency is not about relationship. Competition is the end of relationship. Just try it in your marriage or your romantic life or as a parent. Try to be competitive with your kids and see, see how relational that is or with your spouse. Just try it. It won't work. Trust me, right? And, you know, it, you know, they will use that against you if you say, I really feel horrible for these 10 billion animals. Well, that's the only way we can efficiently use them. Right? Well, that's the only way we can be competitive with other people. They'll use those, that language to stop relationship. There's only healing through relationship. That's the only kind of healing we have is through relationship. And all these cold evil things, the distancing, the, the psychological, emotional distancing from these horrors is a way of not being in relation. So... I should have emphasized that more. Now to your other, more difficult part of your question. Um, hmm. So I have a couple of answers to it. Uh, neither, neither is probably satisfactory. Um, uh, but we know, first of all, it's going to end anyway, right? So by the time Baron Trump is his father's age, there will be no affordable coal, gas. That, that, all that whole energy will be gone and will be way past peak herbicides, and they won't work anymore. Nature will have won in all those ways, right? So we're gonna have to do the change anyway. Now, whether it's a horrifyingly hard landing with millions dying and, and who knows what else is gonna be going on and sort of fascism coming because of all this, I don't, you know, that's, the, the, these are all difficult things, but nature will bat last. But, you know, a couple things, you know, there's a difference between optimism and hope. Optimism for me is I'm optimistic that there is going to be a Super Bowl tonight. Unless some catastrophe intervenes, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen and start around 6.30. Right? I hate the New England Patriots. So I'm hopeful they lose. No one, and I've asked this at many audiences, no one, no history, I've never seen a single article, and you can Google for hours, that predicted the Berlin Wall was going to come down. No one was optimistic that was going to happen in their lifetime. No one. I don't know a single person. Look it up. No one. The most sophisticated professors on Sovietology and... No. But it did. It did come down. No one predicted, not only would Nelson Mandela come out of prison, but he would actually run South Africa and then instead of being vengeful, would start reconciliation councils all across the country to reconcile the white minority with the new black majority and, and government leadership. No one predicted that. I told you about me not being able to predict that Exxon would have all these organic products in it and that I'd be seeing non-GMO on pet food on television. I would not have been optimistic. So hope, I, I would never have dreamed in my lifetime that we'd have a black president. Not optimistic at all about that. Would you have been optimistic? No. You could be hopeful. I'm very hopeful that we have a woman president pretty soon. Uh, maybe not the one that ran, but we won't get into that. So, that, so remember the difference between optimism and hope, right? Be hopeful. Fill your life with, just because you're not optimistic, don't abandon your hopefulness, because that's going to give you energy. It's going to give you, I mean, I've been doing this work for lots of years. I'm not burned out at all, because I remain hopeful, because I've seen these things happen. And my brother Mark, I warned you from the beginning, you know, I told you about him saying good morning is an unproven hypothesis. But uh, Mark had a much, my beloved brother, had a much, um, a much more, I think, 
hopeful expression. I once, um, do people know what bovine growth hormone is? Does that ring a bell with anybody here? So this is, I, I worked on a dairy farm out in Columbia County, New York for a while. And, you know, it's hard to work on a dairy farm with 36 farms without really getting to love those, the, the, the cows. I'm not saying I love the chickens. That's a whole different thing. You guys, if you love chickens out there, talk to me later. You help me, help me, help me. But the cows, absolutely. And so when Monsanto came out with this product in the middle of the 1980s, we litigated, we sued them, and we lost. So I knew that they were going to be putting these steroids in these cows. These cows are going to develop laminitis, mastitis, and it was going to be a horrible suffering for literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of cows in this country. And I called my brother, and he said, Andy, it sounded like you wanted to win. And I said, yeah, of course I wanted to win. He said, that's not your job. You're not required to be successful. You're required to be faithful. So everybody in this room, whether, whatever the issue that is your primary issue, whether it be this food issue, whether it be health issue, whether it be a vaccine issue, no matter what it looks like, don't worry about being successful at the end of the day. That is above our pay scale. You know what you've seen as a considering carefully intuitive and thinking and feeling adult, you've seen the evidence and you say, I believe this is wrong. Be faithful to that. Do what you can. Do the very, very best you can and then be at peace with yourself. So I don't know. I can't answer this gentleman's question necessarily whether it's over or not. I don't know. But I can tell you that the only way we're going to make it happen is by staying faithful to what we believe. Do never compromise on your goals. Compromise on strategy, but never on your goals, never on your beliefs, and stay faithful to that. And remember, it's not about victory. It's acting in a manner that merits victory. You can't assure victory with a bad judge, with a Republican Congress, with an ag committee at a state level that's, that, that's against you. But you can't, you, one thing you can control is being faithful to your ideals, faithful to what you believe, and acting in a manner that merits victory. And stay hopeful. Thank you.